Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. This is the opening episode of Season 3, where we'll be exploring medieval theatre. Episode 48, From Roman to Medieval. Hello everyone, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the last three interview episodes while the historical narrative was on a break. It was great to discuss ancient theatre in performance with people who are out there doing it, being creative and finding ways that these plays speak to us today. We'll never quite leave Roman and particularly ancient Greek theatre behind us. They are in the DNA of theatre through history right up to today and they will inform much of what is to come. But it is, for now, time to move on. If you're a new listener, welcome, and you absolutely can start here if you like. But this is Season 3 and Episode 48 of a largely chronological story, so starting with Season 1, Episode 1, is also a pretty good idea and my recommended approach. If you want to dive back into Season 1 now, we will still be here when you've caught up. As with Season 2, I'll be discussing medieval theatre on the assumption that you've journeyed through the ancient Greeks and the Theatre of Rome with us, and I'll just mention significant reference points with nothing more than a quick reminder of what's gone before. And before we get started properly, I wanted to mention that the frequency of episodes may vary in future. Thus far, I've been able to stick to the schedule that I set myself, but it has occasionally been a close-run thing. I really like putting out roughly half-hourly episodes on a weekly basis, but as we come out of the pandemic lockdown in the UK, there are some other commitments that are becoming more pressing, so I have less time for the research and recording of the podcast. I certainly don't want to sacrifice quality for quantity, either in the recording or in the research, so where necessary I will post new episodes every two weeks to give me time and space that's needed. If you're subscribed to the podcast on your app, then you will get the latest episode whenever it appears, and I will of course put messages on Facebook and Twitter, just so that the delivery of an episode or not is clear. I hope that any such irregularity isn't a problem for any of you, and please do let me know if you have any thoughts or concerns about that. So now we move on, but there's a big gap to fill before we get into the detail of medieval drama. You'll remember that we left the Romans enjoying their mime and pantomime, and not producing any new drama of particular note, at least none that we have a record of. The comedies of Terence and Plautus were presented in revivals to some extent, and the old Greek comedies of Menander may also have continued to be adapted and played in the now permanent theatre buildings in the city and elsewhere in the empire. Even the old Greek tragedies might have been revived, but we don't have any good records for this, and we have to assume that it was the other entertainments that filled the theatres, many of which were adapted to be able to present staged sea battles and other aquatic-based storytelling that became really popular in the later empire. This was storytelling that continued to include elements of mime and pantomime between the elements of spectacle. In the last episode of season two, I discussed the growing influence of Christianity and the negative effect that it had on the theatre, with an effective ban on Christians performing in and even visiting the theatre. Now, we can see that this ban was not entirely effective, as mime and pantomime did survive, flourish even, during the centuries leading up to the fall of Rome. The dislike of these performing arts by the early Christians is not so difficult to understand, The mime was a universal form of entertainment in an empire where many languages were prevalent, so it held a power over a large swathe of people that emperors and religious leaders were no doubt envious of. In particular, Christians objected to real life being represented on stage. The Christian thinking was that human life was a God-given thing, and as such should be experienced at first hand and not in any secondary or pretend form. That was probably the theological expression of an argument that originated with a dislike of what was actually being shown on stage. Performances of pantomime became more and more lavish over the centuries, and more and more indecent. Now that may well explain how they became so popular and pushed spoken drama out of the picture to a very great extent, and also why the Christian fathers felt so strongly about the bad influence of theatre. As I've shown before, Roman tastes were not particularly refined, and even in the earlier days of pantomime, there was a tendency towards lavish spectacle, nudity and, for want of a better phrase, the titillation of the audience. Even simulated sex acts were said to have been part of the pantomime act. With the adoption of Christianity as the official religion under Constantine, centuries of influence by the church began, be that the Latin church centred in Rome, or the Eastern Orthodoxy in Constantinople. <laughs> 
and this directly curtailed theatrical activity. In the early days, when Christianity was still a cult, it was ridiculed in the pantomimes, a fact that the church leaders did not forget once they were close to the levers of power. The curtailment of theatre over a long period coincided with the slow demise of the Western Empire and the fragmentation of the former Roman state. Over long periods, populations decreased, some towns were even abandoned altogether as both Roman empires contracted, and gathering large audiences became harder, even without the new and ever-tightening restrictions. In some parts of the church, actors were refused access to the sacraments and a burial in consecrated ground, a significant concern for any practising Christian where your temporal behaviour was thought to have a direct influence on your potential afterlife. With these restrictions on entertainments and decreasing populations, the larger theatres became less used and then abandoned after the fall of the Western Empire and the fragmentation of the states of continental Europe. Populations in larger cities were reduced from their Roman heights and there was much less need for large spaces for entertainments, which no longer received any state funding or the benefits of artists being able to travel relatively safely through a single empire, however disparate its component parts may have been. And before we leave the Romans, it's worth mentioning the influence from the period that is not explicit, but that can be seen in medieval and other future forms of drama. During the period, some people were still conscious of the Roman concept of mass entertainment. The still standing or partially ruined theatres were present in everyday life of townspeople, especially in the old central areas of the empire in Italy, France and Spain. And although there may have been much misconception about how these sites were used, there would also have been at least some correct collective memory of plays, gladiators, animal baiting and the other entertainments. In addition to the sight and memory of physical sites, there was also inherited language that carried Roman concepts into the medieval period. Perhaps the most significant of these from a theatrical point of view is the word ludus. It's one of those Latin words with a broad meaning that the Romans would have supported with other qualifying words, and it can very rightly be translated as meaning recreation or play or game. We're familiar with the Ludi Festival, which included many forms of entertainment and worship, including theatre, and for all that, the word ludus has the sense of an imitation or heightened form of life being presented under a system of rules. Theatre was the mimetic form of ludus, and we have seen the complex rules and traditions that grew up around the, that form. But the ludus also applied to the athlete pushing his body to the extreme, but within the rules of a race or the gladiator who risked his death in the arena, perhaps the least mimetic form of ludus, as the results were often, well, fatal. The concept of ludus, of controlled imitation and performance, was carried into the medieval period, and forms part of the basic understanding about how theatre and dramatic presentations should work once they become revived in formalised ways. This was matched and was in partnership with the concept of the joke, or more accurately in its original Roman sense of verbal dexterity, a verbal game. Jocus was the Latin that became absorbed into various continental vernaculars, jeu in French for example, but also in Spanish and Italian, where its use was expanded to mean not only jokes, but joining a game and acting a play, jouer une comédie, again in French. The point here is that words were as important as actions from the start of medieval drama and continued to be so throughout its history, regardless of which precise form we're talking about, from the village festival to the courtly play. And this is a traceable link back to the Roman sensibilities. It's from the idea of competition within rules and game playing that some medieval scholars suggest that we have to ditch our preconceptions about theatre in the medieval world, which are usually based on the Shakespearean and post-Shakespearean theatre, and see medieval theatre much more as primarily a community activity, without the structures from the late medieval that we're more familiar with. At certain points, we can talk about professional or semi-professional actors, but for the most of the period, we have to see the creation of theatre as a community activity prepared and performed by amateurs for the benefit of their community. The product of that activity could be religious, it could fulfil a social function and, on occasion, it could have a sexual dynamic, but it was never concerned with promoting or being literature and that fact very much distinguishes it from its predecessors. 
The theatre that was created lacked the self-awareness of the Greek and the Roman theatre, and on the whole had a very much more simplistic aim. It was certainly intended to be educational in a religious sense, which at the time effectively meant also educational in a social sense, as the two were very closely tied. But it was also intended to entertain, and be a central part of whatever the celebration in question was. But before we get too far into the nature of medieval drama, let's go back to the rough timeline as best we can. It's very difficult to put anything like a precise date on when Roman theatre met its final demise and when we can consider medieval theatre started. As I've noted before, with the transition from Greek to Roman, there is never a point where a tradition completely dies for another to spring up spontaneously somewhere else. In every case, there's a slow transition that comes about through a low-level, even underground, survival of dramatic art. It leaves little or no record, but we can detect echoes from the earlier traditions in the new style. That is fairly clear in the Greek to Roman transformation, but perhaps less so in the Roman to medieval traditions. We use the big political events as historical markers, and speak of the fall of the Roman Western Empire as if it were a single event, but in fact it was a slow process, covering a century from about 376 CE when the empire was invaded by non-Roman peoples fleeing the expansion of the Huns. The Roman field army started to collapse 20 years later, leaving Roman lands progressively undefended. But it was not until about 476 that the emperor lost the last of his effective political power and the senate sent the imperial insignia to Constantinople for safekeeping with the eastern emperor Zeno. Although sparse records of theatre renovations well into the 500 CE period survive, the general picture is one of decline and virtual extinction of organised theatrical entertainment for the combination of reasons that I've already mentioned. From manuscripts, we can be fairly sure that the plays of Terence and maybe others were still known, but only performed as readings, if at all. The survival of theatre relied in this period on more humble and less organised forms of entertainment. This was the period of the wandering minstrel, the small group of players going from town to town across Europe, performing as acrobats, jugglers, mimics, wrestlers, ballad singers and animal wranglers, but still storytellers of one sort or another. They carried with them those essential desires to mimic and perform and adapted the skills of the theatre to their new situation. Although none of them would have recognised it, that situation was perhaps not so different from the early Etruscan performers or the first Romans who took the theatre out of the Circus Maximus and into the city, where their life was more itinerant and their performing spaces temporary and mobile. We're in the period that used to be called the Dark Ages, let's say from the 5th to the 10th century CE, but which we now refer to more kindly and accurately as the Early Medieval Period. The age was only considered dark because of the lack of recorded written history and it was wrong to suggest that there was no artistic or cultural output in such a lengthy period. It was, however, a period where there was a lot of warfare, not the least of which was caused by the Scandinavian migrations into most of continental Europe and the outlying British Isles. One of the many things that the Vikings were good at was destroying cultural evidence by direct action, warfare and pillaging of monasteries, or indirectly by the enforced melting down of valuable metals and seizing of valuable jewels by besieged kings so they could pay ransoms and, as became known in England, Danegeld. There was undoubtedly artistic expression, and we can still see some of that in the stained glass windows of the churches that became so central to life, in the mosaics of Byzantium, in a little surviving art and illuminated manuscripts, and in tapestries that hung on castle walls. I think it's worth reiterating at this point that the medieval world was a very different one from our own, and the impact that plays and celebrations had on society were quite different from what we might perceive. Where we are used to theatre divided by light and dark, as with the Greeks and the Romans, the medieval citizen only experienced theatre in locations of equal lighting, be that indoors or out. The world was a quieter place. Even in the towns and the few cities that existed, there was no man-made sound louder than the church bell, a hammer on the wood, a cockerel crowing, or the hum of humanity gathered on the market day. And in time, the crash of the stonemason's hammer and chisel would also get added to that list. The night was completely dark, but for the moon and the thousands of stars visible with the naked eye. 
Clothes were made in the home with effort and designed to do their best against the cold and the wet. In the northern regions of Europe in winter, you were lucky not to be wet or cold or both. The only time you truly got warm and dry was after an evening sat by the open fire. We can think of the climate as broadly similar as today, but at times colder and wetter, particularly in northern Europe. Factors which men and women were acutely aware of. They lived closer to nature and knew the signs of the cycle of the year changing much better than we do. They had little comfort against the cold and dark of winter or the heat of summer and were absolutely dependent on the success of their crops. The good times were summer and autumn when, as long as the harvest was successful, there was plenty of food. But come the end of winter and spring, before the next crops could be harvested, came privations and rationing, sprinkled with hope and faith that you could last until the current growing cycle was complete. The forests that still covered much of northern Europe were dark places and the realm of wild animals, wolf, boar, bear and others. And in the popular imagination were also home to spirits, devils and other unnatural things to be afraid of. Towns and villages were still small affairs and many towns became significantly pared back from their Roman population heights. Travel was still difficult and at certain times of the year impossible for many. Life was lived very locally, and your home was the hub of your life. For many, the local church was the only place they visited on a regular basis, which for some meant daily or multiple times daily. For others, the Sunday visit plus certain saints' days, of which there were very many, was the minimum obligation. Of course, there were the outliers, the non-conformists, the village oddity who didn't quite fit in, most of whom soon became estranged from village and town life, left to their own devices, or, in the extreme examples, the eccentric old woman burned as a witch, or the men outlawed for their savage behaviour. Being cast out from your village was a serious matter. Outlaw meant literally that, outside of the law, so your life could be taken with impunity. Travelling bands of outlaws and other vagrants were not uncommon, as those on the edge of society sought safety in numbers. But in turn, they made travel a difficult proposition for many who feared robbery and abduction. Your home, your family and your village were a place of relative safety and the celebrations that took place there were part of a bonding process as much as they were about letting off steam once in a while. So they took on a greater significance than we might appreciate. Because we have a lot of leisure time and leisure events are easily accessible and plentiful, we treat them very much more lightly than our ancestors did. Just as for the Greeks and the Romans before them, attendance at a festival or celebration was a significant event in the cycle of the year for medieval men and women. Through the reconfiguration of Europe in the post-Roman period, the church survived and gathered strength. Conquering lords became hereditary kings, and some aspired to take on the mantle of the inheritor of the Roman Empire, and some came close, but it was never quite the same. The kings and other leaders came to seek their authority through a partnership with the church, who could recognise them as God's temple representative, and so the church gained power and influence, and in time gained influence not only over the kings, but everyday lives of their subjects too. The ecclesiastical objection to theatre that had started towards the end of the Roman period continued, but for all that the church authorities objected, there must have been a desire for entertainment and celebrations coming from the people. Many towns banned such activities, but what was a wedding party without some entertainment? The man who could eat fire, or the puppet show that retold a well-known story of the dangers of the forest or the foolishness of men? What noble didn't want to entertain his guests with tightrope walkers, or knife throwers, or, for the more refined, music, singing and rhymed storytelling? And in the privacy of a lord's banqueting hall, once the bishop and his acolytes had left for the evening, who knows what private theatre might have been presented? As is often the way, we can detect theatrical activity through the objections raised to it. The early church fathers railed against the, as they would have it, debauched theatre practitioners in pamphlets and sermons. As late as 674 CE, there's mention of theatrical performances in Rome, and there are other references to players and the bad influence that they can have. The outcry from Byzantium was a little less strident, and there are some fleeting earlier references for us to cling to. In 380, Gregory, the Patriarch of Constantinople, was said to have written a tragedy in the style of Euripides, focusing on the crucifixion of Christ. The heretic Arius suggested at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that Christian theatre should be used to counter the prevalence of pagan entertainments, 
His suggestion was not taken up by the council, and he was exiled to Gaul, not for his concern, maybe love for the theatre, but for his more serious heretical view about the dual divinity of God and Christ. That is not the subject for this podcast, but after two years in exile, he was called back by Emperor Constantine, having given at least lip service to repentance of his views. The fact that he died suddenly while awaiting to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion only confirmed his heresy in the eyes of those who supported the now orthodox view of a single divinity. It took a very long time, but eventually the church did take up his suggestion of putting drama to good use in the service of the church. Mime survived in Byzantium for several centuries, possibly thanks to the boost it received under the influence of Justinian's Empress Theodora in the 6th century, who was a mime artist before her elevation by marriage to the emperor, and it was from there that there were hints of Christianised drama. The suggestion is that there were attempts in the empire to adapt the old pagan theatre to the needs of the new religion. Storytelling was still a good way to educate the illiterate masses, and it's possible that the very origins of medieval theatre were in Byzantium. These hints from the 9th and 10th centuries are so slight that we can't draw any firm conclusions, but whatever the exact origins, we can say that medieval drama was very much centred on religion and has its origins as liturgical drama. We can also enjoy the irony that the institutions that called out the most against the performing art were the ones who eventually found themselves succumbing to it, of finding a need and a use for it. Like Greek drama, it's generally accepted that medieval drama developed from the Christian liturgy, and in particular the dramatisation of the Easter story, the Passion and Resurrection of Christ, and the Christmas Nativity. The story of church drama will dominate in the period, but we're not quite there yet. This isn't quite all about the church and religion. Local festivities survived, many of them rooted in the old pagan rites, but given a gloss of Christianity to make them more acceptable the maypole dance, mischief-making as winter draws in, and the Christmas and Easter celebrations themselves often contained, if not plays as such, then short skits that involved mimicry, dressing up in costume, and a performer taking on another persona. Away from the larger towns and the direct authority of the church, theatre of a sort survived in the towns and villages. Dramatic expression also survived in the songs and ballads of the wandering minstrel and troubadours who travelled through most of Europe throughout the period. Their songs and ballads were combinations of complex storytelling and shorter amusing ditties, enabling them to play to both the high and the low born. The French and Italian minstrels particularly developed the art of storytelling of historic deeds and romantic love in long poetic story cycles that culminated in the Romance of the Rose and the various forms of the Arthurian legends. In England, storytelling developed in Old English, the tales of Beowulf and the like, and a basic story of an outlawed underdog went on to be embellished into the fable of Robin Hood. Although not in a religious context and hardly at the same scale, we can certainly draw a parallel with the ancient Greeks, reciting their foundation myths that became the first tragedies. The wandering minstrel was not theatre as we know it, and we don't have proven records about exactly what they did, but again, we can speculate that the urge to mimic, and let's include parody in that too, and perform in conversation with an audience was still there, and strong enough for a performer-to-audience rapport to develop, and where possible, interaction with another performer or two to take place. In this form, theatre lived on, in the village green, in the market square, the communal hall, and at the Lord's Banquet. In previous episodes, I've already mentioned how manuscripts of Roman and Greek plays survived by a combination of preservation in Constantinople and in the Arab world, where the value of the works from antiquity was recognised, and through monastic libraries, where they were mostly ignored, or in a few cases, studied, copied, and used for the purposes of teaching Latin. Knowledge of the plays until the Renaissance was therefore extremely limited to scholars and some interested monks and clerics. One can only imagine the reaction of some of those religious souls to some of the bawdy comedies and extreme violence of the plays. Some copies were no doubt lost in purges as abbots sent pagan works up in flames or scrubbed the expensive pages clean of their pre-Christian nonsense and filled them instead with clerical accounts, monastic shopping lists and at best Christian stories and early church histories. Outside of the aristocracy, literacy and scholarship only survived amongst the clergy and particularly in monastic life. 
Monks continued to be the main copiers of books until the advent of the printing press. So for centuries, it was their decisions that dictated what was available and in turn left to us. As I've already mentioned, in a few cases this included the preservation of Roman texts. One of these religious scholars was a Saxon nun called Horsavitha, who I mentioned briefly in episode 2.13 on the life of Terence. She lived in the second half of the 10th century, spending most of her life in a Benedictine abbey at Gandersheim, now in German Lower Saxony. It seems that she had access to manuscripts of Terence's plays, and admiring and disapproving of them in just about equal measure, she adapted them very freely into six plays, using a Latin form and style more familiar to her than Terence's Roman and, by now, ancient version. Although she still called them comedies, because they had, to her religious mind, happy endings, they were unashamedly moral, allegorical plays. Her heroes and heroines were saintly by nature, but put through horrific ordeals to prove their piety. Such trials, and in some cases even martyrdom, led to salvation. Her stated intention was to use her small God-given talents to praise God and encourage devotion to him. To briefly summarise one of the plays, in Abraham, an old man leaves a virtuous life in a hermitage to care for his niece who's been orphaned. Despite his efforts, the young girl is seduced and elopes with her lover, but is soon abandoned and resorts to prostitution. Determined to save her, Abraham disguises himself as a prospective customer, and just as she is about to give himself to him, he reveals his true self and pleads with her to repent her sinful life and live with him quietly in a life of prayer and devotion to which she agrees. Even in that brief description, you can see a Tarantine plot twisted to suit a medieval Christian ethic, and the good nun's Latin was apparently very good, suggesting that she was well read in the likes of Horace and Ovid too. Her intention was probably not that these plays should be performed, but read to prompt meditation on the lessons contained in the text. A convent deep in the heart of medieval Europe is perhaps the last place where we would expect the light of theatre to be kept alive, but that is one of the extraordinary things about the long story of theatre. It never ceases to surprise. So the influence of Rome survived, albeit in the shadows and in ruins. The influence of Christianity increased as it changed from a secretive cult that initially found adherence amongst the poor and women long before the wealthy and the aristocratic and even emperors came into the fold. With growing membership in different regions of the Mediterranean world and official recognition came differing views about the theological beliefs of the church and disputes and arguments became schism and then heresy. Eastern and Western orthodoxy became established, and both continued to fight their own theological and temporal battles as they became partnered with statehood and the rights of kings, and became concerned with worldly wealth and political power. Through all these centuries, theatre continued in the life of the people, but in an unofficial, more casual way, with practitioners operating on the edge of society and receiving none of the recognition that some of their predecessors had enjoyed. Undoubtedly, it was a tough life for performers but that urge could not be killed off, and when the time came, there were still people willing to step in as performers and enablers of theatre, and that time came when the church was ready to accept mimetic art into the setting of the mass. So next time we're very much in the religious setting, where theatre creeps slowly into the church service as the resurrection and the hope for everlasting life is celebrated in the Easter service. Not for the first time, we see priestly actors in a call and response development between a leader and followers. It's not quite the dithyram or the Greek chorus, but there are some distinct echoes from down the centuries. So there we are, our adventure into medieval theatre has begun. Before we get to the next episode, please do go and have a look at the new podcast website that I have to say looks very sparkly and new. You'll find it at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. You can listen to all the published episodes from there, and I'm steadily adding content all the time. I have a selection of pictures of some ancient and not-so-ancient theatres up, and the latest edition is a bibliography with a selection of the source materials I've used in preparation of the podcast, and also some suggested reading on theatre and history that you might enjoy. If you have any thoughts on anything else that would be useful to have on the website, then please do let me know. There is now a Facebook group that at some point will fully replace the Facebook page, so please find us on Facebook groups and join us there. I'm also on Twitter at THOETP, which is one of the nicer corners of Twitter, so even if you aren't Twitter's biggest fan, please do come and join us there.
If you feel up for a bit more history theatre content, then please do go to patreon.com slash thoetp and join us there for a small monthly fee. Currently, a mini-series on Roman philosophy and philosophers is almost complete. Thanks to those of you who have left me a tip on Kofi.com. I regularly turn the virtual coffees into real ones to keep me going and they are very much appreciated. And finally, if you have any comments or concerns before the next episode, you can contact me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 